I play baseball, basketball, and uh, play football. Those are the three sports that I play big time. When I first started vaping, I just turned 15 years old, so I've been doing it for about a year now. All my teammates do it, and it's just pretty normal for everybody to do it. People that I know that do it, they're like good students, like straight A's. It's a normal thing to do. I was 13 the first time I vaped. People at my high school, they would vape on the bus just because it's like so easy to hide. It's just like a little like black pen. I could just vape at home like my parents don't know at all. When I'm riding my bike, like far distances, it makes me feel like I'm riding away. And the reason I vape is to basically get away and get my mind just off of things. I was 13 years old when I vaped for the first time. I started buying $5 vaporizers, and from there, you know, I moved on to bigger ones. Most of my friends that vape, they use nicotine. A lot of nicotine, actually. Like, because you can put as much nicotine into it as you want. Like, the concentrates can go way past just cigarettes. There are too many flavors to count. There are endless amounts that you can get. There's cotton candy, bubble gum, peppermint. Some that taste like pancakes, coffee flavor. I heard one was unicorn puke. It sounds like cartoon flavors or something. It makes them seem a little bit more kid friendly so people are like okay with doing it. Some of my friends, they're sponsored by vape companies. They just get sent stuff for free because then they like make YouTube videos of all the tricks that they're doing and they're like, oh, this is the juice I'm using. This is the mod I'm using. A lot of people post them on their Snapchat stories or on Instagram of them vaping. They tend to be more popular. You know, I can uh, look up vape and a whole bunch of videos will come up and I can see what kind of cool tricks they're doing, learn what the name is, and I can go look it up on YouTube about how to do it. It's the whole culture. It's kind of a big deal for a lot of people that I know. Sometimes I do feel pressured into vaping. With all this social media nowadays, it has a really big effect on what people just think about you. If you don't vape, you're looked at as an uh, outsider, so everybody does it. I think people that you would never expect would definitely be vapors. It's becoming like more and more popular. Vaping is considered cool in my group of friends. It might just be the fact that you're doing something you know you shouldn't be doing. There's no worry that our parents are gonna find us vaping on social media. We've gotten really good at hiding it from our parents. I know I'm underage, but it's just something that I do. I won't let it affect my future. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Samantha Pinzel. I'm a public health educator for the Marathon County Health Department. I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for coming to our Big Tobacco Turned Into Big Vape event, brought to you by the Central Wisconsin Tobacco Free Coalition, which serves Marathon, Portage, and Wood Counties. Uh, just a special thank you to our presenters, as well as to North Central Healthcare for allowing us to utilize this space. And a thank you to the AOD partnership for allowing us to record this noon session. This video recording will be posted at their YouTube channel at aodpartnership.org. So if you have colleagues or anybody else that you know of who would um, really benefit from this information, it will be available there for you to view in the future. Uh, just quickly, um, this is a short program, however, if you need to use the restroom, please feel free to get up and do so. Um, just straight out the doors into the right down the hallway by the pool, you'll find some bathrooms. So the presentation will take about um, one hour. Um, we would like to save all questions for the end. Um, there will be some time where all of the presenters will come back up. So if you think of a question, don't forget it or um, remember to write it down for our presenters. There are evaluation sheets, which hopefully you've all received. If you haven't, they're on the back table. Um, your feedback's important to us, so please fill those out, and then please just indicate on the form somewhere how you heard about this event. If you did not get a chance to look at all of the vaping products on the back table, please do so um, on your way out. Jenna will be covering what a lot of the products are, um, but it's different to see it in picture than up close um, in person, so make sure to check out those products. 
For our learning objectives for today, we'd like you all to become familiar with local youth vaping trends, what's been in the news recently, as well as marketing tactics that have helped gain a new generation of users um, addicted to nicotine, and also why we should all be concerned about this. Also, to gain an understanding of the harmful effects nicotine addiction has on the developing adolescent brain. And lastly, to learn about some resources available for teens and youth advocates. So to begin our presentation, we will first hear from Jenna Flynn, who is the Tobacco Control Coordinator from the Central Wisconsin Tobacco Free Coalition. Please welcome Jenna. Thank you everyone for being here this afternoon and possibly giving up your lunch hour. We appreciate the time. I'm just going to put out a disclaimer um, first and initially. This is not a presentation uh, to tell you that tobacco is bad, smoking is bad. I'm really here uh, and all of our presenters are here today to focus on youth and why uh, vaping is dangerous uh, for youth specific to nicotine addiction. So as far as uh, how tobacco companies and e-cigarette companies are advertising some of their products, this is what we're seeing. What do you guys notice about the advertisements here? The picture closest to me is advertising for cigarettes and uh, the one on the other side is e-cigarettes. Don't be shy. Pretty similar, right? Um, tire doesn't change its stripes. A lot of the advertising is very similar with these products. Same thing. Cigarettes are cool. Cigarettes are sexy. Cigarettes are um, fun to smoke with your friends. Same thing with e-cigarettes. The advertising is extremely similar. So while we've seen smoking rates go um, down and they are at an all-time low right now, the e-cigarette trends um, and the teen vaping usage has really uh, blown up um, across our counties, across the state, and nationally. Uh, some is really something to be concerned about. Do you remember this guy? Joe Camel, the face of tobacco? This is now the face of e-cigarettes. So this is um, a woman who's heavily advertised for Juul products. Um, they're making some changes in their advertisements now uh, when youth usage has skyrocketed. Uh, but this is what teens are seeing on their Twitter pages, Facebook, Instagram. This is uh, the type of advertisements that we're seeing. So as far as e-cigarette usage across the state, the most recent information shows us that 13% of teens have used um, e-cigarettes. I suspect that that has skyrocketed in the last year. And as a show of hands, um, can I see who uh, is in the room that's school admin? Counselors, teachers, principals, therapists? A raise of hands if you think that this is higher. This is all theoretical, but yeah. It's blown up. Um, in our county, it's, it's, there's such a need for resources um, for this issue, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more later. So across the nation, as far as high school usage and middle school usage, we've seen the rates go up um, by almost 80% for high schoolers and 50% for middle schoolers. That's really concerning to me. As far as local trends go, uh, this is the most recent data that we have with e-cigarette usage. Um, I suspect that this is higher as well. Portage County's information is the most recent, and Wood County and Marathon County's data is from last year. However, I want to point out that Marathon County's data is limited because only four out of the 10 school districts asked a question about e-cigarettes. I suspect that the volume of responses could create a higher um, rate of e-cigarette usage if that question were asked, which it is going to be in the spring. Um, so those numbers are pretty concerning. So why should we be concerned about this problem? The products are attractive to youth. They're cheaper um, than e -cigar or traditional cigarettes. I'll talk about that more later. Um, and the packaging is um, attractive and it's easily accessible. Who ha 
hasn't seen an e-cigarette that looks like one of these images? Raise your hand. Everyone seen something that looks like this? Oh, I see in the back. We'll do it. We'll do a 101. Before I do that, I want to gauge um, the audience and see who I have in here. So I said school admin. Can you guys raise your hands again? Anybody that works in the schools? Healthcare? Public health? Community partner? Uh, parents? And two minutes. Law enforcement? All right. Thank you. Legislators? <laughs> okay, so this um, is Vaping 101. We're going to give an overview here of what these products are. So the one on the bottom is a I would call a traditional vape pen. I have it up here. There's one on the back table. If you did not see it, I encourage you to check it out on your way out the door. But these products, it doesn't matter what you call them. They're all intended to do the same purpose, which is to get that nicotine buzz, that inhalation that you would get. So the products, the part on the left, or my left hand side, probably your right hand side, that's the battery. So th that's the piece that actually heats the liquid and transforms it into aerosol. I call it aerosol and not vapor because there are chemicals that are produced um, when the liquid is heated. So this is the battery piece here. Um, this middle piece in the image there, that's where the e-liquid is actually poured into, and then the mouthpiece is where the user would inhale that aerosol. The product on uh, the far side here, away from me, that's a modular device. Those products tend to be more expensive. Um, I've heard they can range anywhere from $80 to a few hundred dollars. Not typically found in our schools because they're um, tougher to conceal and they tend to give off a larger smoke plume. However, I heard that there was one confiscated last week at a local district. So we have mastered vaping devices. We know what they are. Seeing some head nods. Okay. This is vaping in 2018. These are some of the products that we're seeing in the schools and among our youth. I would like a volunteer to come up on stage and join me to identify the six vaping devices that I have in this image. Who wants to go? Come on up. Brave souls. I'm going to call on my coworker, Amy. <laughs> come on up. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you for volunteering. So Amy, if you, could, if you could go next to the PowerPoint and point out what you think the six e electronic nicotine delivery systems products are. Uh, I think these two. One, two. Uh, this one. Three. Or six. <laughs> four. Five. Oh, up top. The one on top? The yep. One? Oh. Six. Oh, Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. So I put Amy on the spot um, because she works in environmental health and is um, doesn't work in tobacco every day like I do, but probably like like Amy, most of you guys don't work in tobacco and do tobacco things every day like I do. I'm learning about this stuff like yesterday, last week. So if I don't know about this stuff, how are our parents and educators supposed to know about this stuff? How are our legislators supposed to know about this stuff? We need to be aware of the issues and the fact that you guys are even here today um, is a great step in making progress towards um, this issue. So these are some of the products that we are seeing being confiscated in our schools. Okay, so we mastered vaping products in 2018. What about the paraphernalia that goes with it? The chargers, the USB ports, the connectors, the cables. Everybody know what those are? Yeah, easier said than done. Okay, if you're like me and you have a drawer of chargers in your house, do you know what all those chargers go to if you're a parent? I'm not saying, I'm not putting on the kids, but I'm just saying, you know, we need to create an awareness about these issues because there's, a, this stuff is coming at us at rapid fire and we need to be aware of, of what's going on. 
So this product, it's called a badge. There's one on the back table if you want to take a peek at it. Uh, same as what I mentioned before, it does the same purpose as this vape pen. It's just shaped differently. It reminds me of one of those tri highlighters. Um, that's what I thought of when I first saw it. This is affecting our local schools. This was confiscated in Portage County. What's this one? Is this an e-cigarette? Yes, I guess it is. This was confiscated, Marathon County. Okay, these products are hitting home locally and we cannot keep up with what they are and um, who they are affecting and what districts, but I will tell you, our coalition has been getting requests. The three counties that we cover, there is such a need um, for resources and awareness about these issues. Again, they're all intended for the same effect and it's to get that, that nicotine buzz. What, are they, what does this product remind you of when you see the writing on the bottom? Does it look like anything? Uh, like a lighter, something, a sleek, tech, techy device. It reminded me of Samsung Galaxy phones with the writing on the back. This is not a coincidence. E-liquids and pods. So as far as e-liquids go, I, I guess the big takeaway that I, I want you to leave with is that there's been a lot of gray area as far as are these products regulated, are they not regulated? There was a deeming rule put in place by the FDA a few years ago that said these products have to be regulated. The timeline and steps for that ha has been very vague. So there's still a lot of unknowns with e-liquid. What I do know is a little container of e-liquid like this has what's equivalent to two packs of nic or two packs of cigarettes in terms of nicotine. What you should also know is these products are highly toxic highly potent. If a toddler gets this, it can kill them. So it's not to be taken lightly. The products don't have to have a, a child-proof lock on them. Um, a lot of the products do now just because of what we've been seeing, um, you know, in terms of environmental health and poison and things. Um, but, but that's an issue too. And speaking in terms of the Juul pods, who has not heard of a Juul in this room? Okay, so, so we, know, we know it's coming with that part of it. With the Juul pods, the nicotine is already in there, but what we've been seeing is, uh, I won't talk about this too much, but the products can be manipulated so other things can go in the, in the pods. Um, in Grand County, you, you might have heard the news story that a kid almost died that tried to vape alcohol. So those are some of the issues that we're seeing. And I guess another big takeaway with e-liquid is that there has been some research and studies that have shown that some of these products say there's zero milligrams of nicotine in them. There has been research that have shown there is traces of nicotine in the products. So if you work in school and you have a kid saying, oh, there's no nicotine in here, it's hard because there's really no way to tell unless you have some kind of um, you know, special mechanical scientific gadget to check that. Um, something else I want to point out, um, check it out on your way out. There are actually nicotine packets that if a user buys a, a container of e-liquid that says zero milligrams of nicotine, they can actually buy a pod of nicotine and put it in there. So really, really anything goes with this stuff. So, so what? Why do we care? Vaping's safer than smoking, right? That's what we've heard. These products are not harmless and they should not be in the hands of our youth. Okay, some of these products, Tammy's gonna talk more about what we've seen um, with long-term and short-term outcomes of vaping, um, but we know that there have been dangerous chemicals that have been found in the products and we know that it does affect adolescent brain development. Something else that I think is important to know too that I'm learning as I go to, these products, the heating coils can actually give off um, chemicals as well. So it's not just the e-liquid, it's also the devices too. I want to share a story. This isn't my focus of today, but there was an incident in Wood County. Um, a middle schooler had an e-electronic nicotine delivery system in his pocket. The thing blew up. He got third degree burns. It was a mess, okay? So that's not to be taken lightly either. 
So ad adults like flavors too, right? These, these are marketed to adults. Adults like them. They're used to quit smoking. Sure. Nine out of 10 of our Wisconsin youth wouldn't try these products if they weren't flavored. Okay, so while, while adults might like these, and they might be safer in terms of someone who's already been smoking cigarettes, sure, they should not be in the hands of our youth. As far as nicotine goes in the products, I want to give you a, a little context as far as why the Juul is more concerning and some of these other products that are up and coming is more concerning. The nicotine in the Juul products is salt-based. And the difference between salt-based nicotine and free-based nicotine is that salt-based is um, stronger and it's not as harsh tasting. So in other words, you get more bang for your buck. Um, I am concerned about this because since nicotine is addictive, I'm worried that the usage um, will increase. And in fact, we've been seeing that in the schools. We've been hearing from all of our districts, kids are blowing through these jewel pods in a day, in a half a day. Um, when I hear about uh, a local district yesterday, in two hours, seven jewels were confiscated. Seven. My first thought is, wow, these kids are really bold. My second thought, these kids might be addicted and they have to bring their products in the school to get them through the day. When I was in high school, I thought it was cool to bring my phone into school. Now these kids are bringing their e-cigarettes into school. So in speaking in terms of prices, how accessible are these products? In reality, they seem pretty pricey up front. 50 bucks, kind of hefty. Still expensive compared to a pack of cigarettes to get you all set up. 35 bucks though, once you have the device, you're good to go. The pods, less than $4, breaks down to $15 a pack. Now looking at a pack of cigarettes, <coughs> it's a pretty good deal. There is no excise tax on these products currently. Traditional cigarettes are taxed at about $2.52 a pack. These products have nothing. So it's a pretty good deal in speaking in terms of nicotine. And this is how kids can get the products online. We're hearing some of the vape companies are going to strengthen up their um, age restrictions online. But just like anything else you can buy online, it's, it's pretty hard to monitor. When I was doing my research for this presentation, all I had to do was bring up a website and click through, yes, I'm 21, okay, good to go. So that's really concerning. The other thing that we're hearing in our schools is that 18 year olds are selling, buying the products and selling them at a higher price. That's a pretty good profit for a teenager and there's a lot of that going on in our schools. So as far as what we know, um, the FDA has been taking action and having some discussion around this pro these problems. They know that this is a huge issue for our teens. They know um, that we're priming a new generation that's going to be addicted to nicotine. Uh, so they are taking steps to remove some of the flavors from traditional brick and mortar stores. Um, the vape shops currently will still have their flavors um, accessible. However, kids, um, you have to be 18 years of age to enter those stores. Jewel has disbanded some of their social media and they're looking to remove some of their flavors as well. The bottom line with this is that there is no hard and fast timeline with some of this stuff. So there's still a lot of unknowns and um, I guess we just really need to be aware of what's going on and what we need to look out for. So I would encourage you to continue to watch the news. Um, and you know, stay tuned for, for some of these things. But I guess the big takeaway is that you know, all of the schools have, have voiced concerns. It's the modern take on smoking behind the bleachers. There's a parenting alert this morning about the danger of teens vaping. The FDA warning about liquid nicotine used in e-cigarettes. Juuling, named after this brand of vape pen, exploding in popularity among teens. A hidden trend now coming out of the shadows. I've definitely seen kids drool in class. Kids are going to the bathroom, smoking it in stalls. Next thing you know, you're hooked like that and 
You can't stop. School districts cracking down, parents up in arms, and kids, some unwittingly, becoming addicted to nicotine before they even graduate from middle school. Their hands to this product, and they don't know what it is. They don't know it's nicotine. They don't know it's bad for you. They don't know the long-term consequences. The Juul heats up liquid nicotine that users inhale, made for adult smokers looking to quit cigarettes. I'm like constantly encouraging people to use this and not smoke. They feature flavors like cool mint and fruit medley. It's capsules or pods, which some kids tell us they go through in a day, contain roughly the same amount of nicotine as a pack of cigarettes. It's packaging more like a Silicon Valley must have than a smoking product. You have a techie device. It looks really cool. It's slim. You can hold it in your, the palm of your hand. Your teacher, your parent has no idea what's going on. Uh, you can get it in cool flavors. Those flavors, part of what freshman Margarita Ferreira says enticed her. I've never been exposed to tobacco. Why would I try it? But since I was exposed to fruit, obviously, and mango and mint, that I just thought it was okay. She says she's been jeweling for about a year, and she started in eighth grade. The first time I used a jewel, I couldn't stop coughing. Like I didn't really like it, but then after I got the hang of it and I was able to get head rushes, I was just like... I just didn't want to stop using it. It's just a part of my life now that, like, I know it's bad, but I can't stop. Margarita sharing her struggles alongside her high school classmates in this now viral video. All of the people in my grade started using it. When I'm doing my homework every night, I'll be writing, and then all of a sudden I'll want a jewel rip, and I'll have my pencil in my right hand and my jewel in my left. The project, the brainchild of high school senior Jack Waxman, who says he grew more and more concerned watching his friends struggle with nicotine addiction. The problem was getting worse and worse in my school, and I felt like I wanted to create a video as a kind of like a cautionary tale to sixth graders, maybe, who are thinking of starting the Juul. Kids say a Juul is easy to conceal, e-cigarette vapor less visible and less odorous compared to smoking. With cigarettes right now, it's highly stigmatized. Um, it's very frowned upon to use it, but with the Juul, kids see it as something that is kind of just like their iPhone, you know, they have their jewel and their iPhone. At school, kids will leave class to go to the bathroom because at any point of the day, there will be someone, there will definitely be someone in the bathroom, either it's the girls' or boys' bathroom, there will be someone with a jewel or any type of e-cigarette. A month after that video went live, Jack's about to take his advocacy work up a notch. Off to meet with legislators to try to raise the age to buy any kind of nicotine in his county to 21. So as we saw in the video, these students are concerned about their peers getting addicted to nicotine, and with nicotine addiction comes other health concerns. Another thing to quickly mention is that locally we're seeing this um, across all different groups of students. So you might traditionally think of a certain type of student or kid who smokes. Um, we see students vaping in all different groups or cliques, if you want to call it. Um, this is happening locally across the state and across the nation. So next we'll hear from Tammy Newman, clinical coordinator for the Family Health Center Substance Abuse Services Marshfield Clinic on the signs of nicotine addiction and the adolescent brain and why we should be concerned. Please welcome Tammy. Well, thank you. It's good to be here with you all today. Um, I pick up, um, I really appreciate those videos because I think that the, uh, that the users say it best um, and um, with some of the comments about their experiences. And what I um, noticed um, from the first video that there was a young man who stated, I won't let it affect my future. Um, based on that comment, um, that uh, that may not be the case. It may be beyond his control if he would continue to use uh, nicotine-based products, but um, I'll prevent, uh, present some um, additional information about that. Why should, why should we be concerned about vaping epidemic among teens? There's a couple things going on here, and is that you've got the addiction piece of the ongoing use of nicotine, or I should say exposure and ongoing use, and that there is evidence that nicotine exposure can harm the developing brain. 
There's a strong association with other use of tobacco products. A nicotine molecule is a nicotine molecule. If you can't get it in your vape, you can always get it in a cigarette or chew. There's the, uh, adolescence is the critical period for influencing tobacco use and related behaviors and that nearly all tobacco, adult tobacco users first initiate, initiated tobacco or nicotine use in their youth or young adulthood. The unknowns is the effects from the aerosol vapor. Uh, they've just not been around long enough. I'd like to give a shout out uh, to this report. Um, the e-cigarette use among youth and young adults uh, report. Um, the um, Surgeon General at the time who was in position um, in 2016 was a Dr. Vivek Murthy um, and that this is the first report issued by a federal agency that comprehensively reviews the public health issue of electronic cigarettes and their impact on our nation's young people. Um, of note during that same year the Surgeon General's report on alcohol, drugs and health was also released. The first ever Surgeon General's report on that topic. I love Dr. Murthy because he gets it. Some basic brain facts. Now, what I encouraged uh, in my earlier uh, presentation today, um, one of my roles is that I visit patients in the hospital. And even though I'm asked to stop and see them about their alcohol use or drug use, I always ask them about their nicotine use as well. And what I can tell you is that I really need to develop an elevator speech about nicotine use, about why it is harmful. And again, when I talk about brain facts, we are, there are going to be some diagrams. Certainly, I do not pull out a diagram and talk about brain structure and brain chemistry and all such things. Um, it would just, when people would want to know, youth want to know, um, why is it bad for me? Why is it that, uh, why will it perhaps affect my future? Basic brain facts. The brain is the last organ in the human body to develop fully. Brain development continues into the early to mid-20s. It used to be uh, when I was growing up, 18 was the legal age, therefore you must all be developed and there you go, you're good to go. And what research has found is that that is not the case, is that brain development continues into the mid-20s. Adolescence is a significant time of growth and development inside the teenage brain. Think of it as a pretty significant remodeling project. There's pruning that occurs in the gray matter. Um, it is of the use it or lose it principle. That's when some connections are strengthened and those that are not used um, are lost. The pruning begins in the back of the brain. The back of the brain is where the more, the earlier first developed structures exist and through time, brain development back to front. The front is where the prefrontal cortex is, which is where the higher functions are as far as decision making and of rational thought. Um, with, uh, with adolescent decision making, because that part of the brain is not fully developed, they tend to rely more on other areas of the brain, including the amygdala, which is more in the central area of the brain. And that area is associated with emotions, impulses, aggression, and instinctive behavior. This is, this is a more simple um, image of the brain, but I like it. I came across some that had terrific detail to it with structures, and um, this just says it simply. So when the brain is developed, um, you would go from the, the left to your right, that prefrontal cortex area last to develop, and you can see the amygdala tucked underneath there um, in the, in the um, center of the brain. How does nicotine affect the adolescent brain? Well, exposure during this period of growth disrupts the formation of those brain circuits that control attention, learning, and memory. And they, this group is at uniquely at risk for long-term, long-lasting long effects of exposing the developing brain to nicotine, a couple of reasons. The brain is developing, and it would be a matter of the length of exposure over time. What are some short-term effects about vaping? 
Um, there's, a, a, there's two levels of, of concern here with the short-term effect, and it would be of the nicotine and then also of the vapor exposure. You would have the positive reinforcement, is that it's a cool thing to do. If it's your first uh, couple times, it kind of gives you that head rush, that buzzy feeling, feeling pretty good. Brain chemicals are released, is a good thing to do. I'll probably do it again. Uh, the susceptibility to nicotine addiction um, is that, that exposure. Uh, the exposure to the aerosol, it can contain harmful and potentially harmful ingredients, including nicotine itself. Uh, diacetyl, uh, causing serious lung disease. Ultrafine particles, heavy metals such as nickel, lead, and tin. Volatile organic compounds, and cancer-causing agents such as acrylene. The other issue here is that I would like to um, um, touch on again is what Jenna had, had brought up was about the nicotine, about nicotine salts. It was toward the end of her presentation. And that there's new research that has found that with nicotine exposure through the nicotine salts is that it's believed to increase the amount and the rate of nicotine uptake uh, with e-cigarette users. Again, meaning earlier addiction. And then also there's a, um, new research, not yet published, through the Journal of Addiction Medicine is that nicotine was found to have a profound effect on the sleep of adolescents. So two brand new pieces of information. The biology of nicotine addiction. Now, the easy thing to remember here, I guess, in this whole picture is that this is all about nicotine, nicotine acting on nicotine receptors. And if anyone has, has attended any of the education about opioid addiction, this is similar in that the, you, perhaps you have heard about opioids um, um, binding to opioid receptors. The same thing goes for nicotine receptors as well. The longer you're exposed to nicotine, the more receptors you have. With the, with the exposure to nicotine, once it's in the body, it connects to a receptor, neurotransmitters are released, and that's when you get that positive reinforcement. Woo, feels pretty good. So then over time, you, you develop a tolerance to it. Um, and it's kind of like that one young lady said. She talked about getting head rushes, and then she talked about, then you gotta have it. So through that developing of, of tolerance over time, pretty soon it, it, you are moved into the matter of addiction. And it's not so much that you feel so good from the use anymore, but that you need to use the nicotine in order to stave off withdrawal symptoms. Not so much fun. What are some of the long-term effects of vaping? Again, over time, the increased susceptibility to nicotine addiction through exposure, learning and cognitive deficits, mood disorders, and permanent lowering of impulse control. Remember that, that, that all the remodeling that's going on at the brain and the pruning process. And with the aerosol, again, the increased exposure to harmful ingredients over time. And again, vaping has not been around for that long, so we are, the long-term effects are not known. The use of substances actually rewires the brain, in that why can't people who are addicted just quit? And that, so these are how the pathways are developed, in that in a non-addicted brain, uh, the control is the biggest piece, and that, um, that as far as making a decision that that's something maybe you don't want to do, you just don't have to go there. In the, a brain that is addicted to a chemical, in that if you see a cue, um, in that perhaps you are with friends who um, are, are vaping or you see an ad, um, and is that as far as um, um, that, that control piece gets smaller, and again, you wish to use your substance because that's what makes you feel normal. What does vaping have to do with other addictions? 
Nicotine can affect development of the brain's reward system and that it primes adolescent brain for addiction to other drugs such as cocaine and methamphetamine. And e-cigarette devices may be used to deliver other illicit substances um, such as cannabis. How teens differ from adults in terms of addictive behavior using vaping devices is that curiosity to, to try uh, the next thing, the cool thing. I think the video spoke very well to that. Um, is that all your friends are doing it, everyone's doing it, you're on Instagram, and so um, why not, I'll give it a try. Um, all the different flavors, um, it's amazing to me because um, that, oh boy, uh, well, we sk kind of skipped down to that last bullet where it talks about highly focused marketing, um, and you just know that uh, the uh, a pancake flavor, it probably is not uh, being uh, purchased by truckers, um, that it indeed um, is uh, focused at youth. Um, Jenna spoke about, too, uh, that uh, the belief e-cigarettes are safer than other tobacco products, especially cigarettes, and that, well, what's the problem? It just contains harmless water vapor, and that is not true, um, is that some may contain nicotine that is not labeled. Again, some of the, some, as Jenna spoke to also, is that some of the e-cigarette industry, if you will, is the Wild West. It is not regulated at this point in time. And again, hide the highly focused marketing. The other thing too I want to um, talk about, I guess, you know, when I, um, uh, when I see people vaping is that there has to be a different uh, behavior also with vaping than there is with cigarettes. Um, is that I call it, I refer to it, well, it's my own term, as the suck factor um, on a cigarette versus on a vaping device. Um, and, I, and also smoking behavior, I would think that you would have to hold that vapor and a larger lungful for a period of time in order to make all those lovely plumes, circles, um, as we have seen. Because usually you, you do not see, um, traditionally, that type of behavior with cigarette use. These are some of my favorite resources. Um, the first one, um, is the report uh, that I referred to initially uh, from the um, Surgeon General uh, under the resources button. Uh, a lot of good, good information there. Um, the second resource from the CDC um, that also speaks to the um, uh, Surgeon General report. A little different uh, way of organizing the, the material, very user friendly. I liked it, which is why I included it here. And that last resource um, is the easy to read um, um, e-cigarette facts. A lot of information is geared to providers or parents, what you tell youth, but I like this one because it specifically talks, speaks to the user themselves. And then I included all my references um, that, uh, that uh, I reviewed for and in information that I included in my presentation, um, including the, two non uh, the DOI numbers to the two um, studies um, that are not yet published. So, and with that, um, I will um, pass along to my colleague. Thank you. As Tammy has explained, this is why vaping is such a concern when speaking in terms of addiction and youth brain development. To conclude our presentation today, we'll hear from Alex Peters, Alex is the Northwestern Regional Outreach Specialist for the Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention. She will provide information on resources that we can share. Please welcome Alex. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Peters, and I am the Northwestern Regional Outreach Specialist at the UW Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention. I serve 27 counties. My office is in Eau Claire. Um, my counties go as north as Superior and as south as La Crosse, so I do a lot of traveling. So driving to Wausau seems like a short drive from Eau Claire, um, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, let me see if I can move that. 
forward. So this is a little bit different audience than I normally present to. Most of my work is with healthcare systems, healthcare providers, um, but increasingly in the last few months, I have been getting so many requests from schools and educators uh, to come speak about what cessation resources are available for youth. Um, and unfortunately, I have to tell them that this is just such a new and emerging problem. There are not a ton of resources available. Um, however, I'm going to share several with you today that um, do counsel for e-cigarettes and then some that can be adapted um, to serve those who are trying to quit e-cigarettes. So the first resource I want to talk about is the Wisconsin Tobacco Quit Line. Um, this is something that you might be familiar with already, um, but I just wanted to let you guys know that they are a resource to serve those who are 13 years and older. And they counsel not only for cigarettes, they also do e-cigarettes and um, chewing tobacco as well. The main way of accessing the quit line is by calling that 1-800-QUIT-NOW number. When you call the quit line, you're going to speak um, to an actual real life person and they call those quit coaches. All of the quit coaches have four year degrees, many even have advanced degrees, and they all receive extensive and ongoing training, which really helps them provide that individual tailored counseling to every single caller. So they have been trained in how to um, speak with youth about this issue and how to counsel them um, to get off of e-cigarettes. I also want to mention that they do have a nicotine replacement therapy that they will send out to callers who are 18 years and older. So if you're working with some older um, individuals in a high school who are 18 years, um, they are eligible to receive either two weeks of the patch, gum, or lozenge, which would be mailed to them at no cost. They also have another really great feature. Um, you can access the quit line online at their website. So if you're working with a student who's not too keen on picking up the phone and having to talk to somebody, they are able to create a username and password where they can log on and chat to quit coaches online. They can speak with other individuals who are trying to quit e-cigarettes on different forums. Um, on this website, they can also build and track a quit plan, and it has different features where they can see how much money they might have saved by not purchasing e-cigarettes. Um, so it's just another really great way to access the quit line. They're also going to send some printed materials if they're interested. Um, and the quit line serves more than just um, the users who are calling in. If you ever are curious to how um, their intake process looks or what um, talking to a quit coach sounds like, you can call them and they can walk you through that process as well. Another really great resource I want to share with you um, is this app. It's called the Quit Start Mobile app, and it was designed by um, the NCI Institute in collaboration with the FDA. This is a resource that was designed to help kids quit um, cigarettes. However, um, the same principles can be applied to e-cigarettes. It's going to have different features on the app. Um, so if you're having, it asks you what's up. So if you're having a craving, you can click on the I'm having a craving, and it's going to bring up a list of different um, inspirational quotes. It has a game section that it can distract you from that craving to get you over it, um, as well as different challenges. They have a feature on there too where you can share your progress. Um, so you can share on uh, Instagram or Facebook that you've been three days without your jewel. Um, so that's just one feature of it. It's rated for ages 12 plus, um, and it's just a really cool feature to check out. You can download it for free on the App Store. Another great program is Smoke Free Text for Teens, or Dip Free Text for Teens. Um, this is a resource, again, that was originally designed for cigarettes, um, but could also be applied to e-cigarettes, in my opinion. Um, so you can register for this program just by um, Googling Smoke Free Text, and it's going to pop up. Um, how it works is you're going to register, and you're going to set a quit date. You're then going to receive text messages for um, around six to eight weeks that are going to provide motivation throughout your quit attempt. There's also a feature where you can text um, crave, mood, or slip into this line, and it's going to, depending on what you, what you text in, so if you text in slip, um, it's going to send you some messages to help you get back on track if you were to slip up and um, go back to your jewel. If you're having a craving, it's going to send you some different motivational uh, messages to help get you through that, um, and it can send three to five texts a day. So again, this is just another program that's available. 
And then finally, I wanted to share um, this really great uh, one-page report, I think it's more than one page, report that was put out by the Surgeon General. It was referenced earlier, and there are copies of it on the front table where you registered when you walked in. Um, this lists specific, um, specific points and questions that you can bring up with youth, um, and it tells you how you can initiate this conversation um, and different things that are important to let youth know when talking about e-cigarettes. And then these are some of my favorite resources. They're similar to Tammy's. Um, so that Know the Risks reports, um, they have materials designed for you as educators and parents, but they also have materials designed um, for adolescents that describe the risks of e-cigarettes. The Truth Initiative is just an amazing resource. Um, they design all of their materials um, specifically with youth in mind. Um, so they have really great videos, resources, and they have a new campaign. You might have seen the ads, um, Safer Does Not Equal Safe. Um, so those are something good to check out. And then finally, the CDC has um, a great page on e-cigarettes for more um, information. And um, how many of you have seen the Tobacco is Changing campaign anywhere? Is anyone familiar with this? Okay, so on one hand. So this is a campaign that the Department of Health Services put out this year, um, and it focuses on educating parents on the changing culture of tobacco products. So their main um, mantra here is, here's to hoping your kids hate sweets. You heard a little bit about the different flavors that are available. Um, so this is really educating parents on these crazy flavors that are um, really attracting youth, as well as different products that are being put out. So you can find this campaign on DHS's websites, on their Facebook pages, um, and they have some really great videos that you can share. And so that is all I have for you guys. Thank you. Thank you again to all of our wonderful presenters today. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so we would like to open it up for questions. If anybody has specific questions for any of the presenters. I do have one more thing I forgot to mention. So uh, when we were talking about e-cigarettes, we're talking about how they're dangerous for youth uh, and that youth should definitely not be using this product. Um, uh, however, a lot of times I get questions from doctors or physicians saying, my adult patients um, want to use this device to quit smoking. Is this something um, safe? Is this something that I should recommend? Um, what are our official stance on e-cigarettes for adults at UW Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention is, um, is what I tell doctors is really encourage your patients to use a known evidence-based method of quitting, uh, which is a combination of counseling and medication. However, if they're really insistent on using an e-cigarette to quit, let them know that while these products may be less harmful than smoking a traditional combustible cigarette, we know that they're not 100% harm-free, and we don't know what the long-term health effects of these products are. So if you have someone who really wants to use that e-cigarette, let them know that using the e-cigarette should be a bridge off of nicotine completely. It shouldn't just replace that combustible cigarette that they're smoking. Because um, what we tend to see, um, and what we're seeing with youth now kind of in reverse, is that when a combustible cigarette user goes to an e-cigarette, they begin to use both products, so dual use. So they're smoking the combustible cigarette when they can, and then they're using the e-cigarette when they can't smoke a traditional cigarette. And what we're seeing with youth is that they start off with the e-cigarette, and then they move to traditional combustible cigarettes. So as far as adults using them, we know that they're not harm free, but if they're using it off a of bridge off of nicotine completely, it's still, the research isn't quite there yet. So just wanted to put that out there. Do you know what the effects are to people around somebody who's vaping? Like, does that nicotine filter in the air? Like, if someone's vaping in your house or <laughs> um, you know, from what I, my, my, I, I want to say my opinion, but it's more than my, than my opinion, is what the research shows, is that, that that's what that aerosol contains. You know, whether you're breathing it in or breathing it out. 
And so then you get into all the secondhand uh, vapor. I would say, and thirdhand vapor too, once all the ingredients land, um, including all the heavy metals and such things. So I, I think you know it's comparable because again, um, as Jenna had said, that it is not just the vapor that goes poof into the air, that there are other contents of that of those clouds as well. And we shared some of the chemicals that have been found in the products. The tricky thing with these products is that they've just been up and coming in recent years. And with big tobacco and cigarettes, we didn't know a lot of the data and research for decades. And then we did, and we see how that turned out. So stay tuned. Yes? Anything known about um, the effects on developing fetus? Question on anything known on effects of the developing fetus. Um, we know that nicotine in any form is not good for developing fetus. That's why even um, when pregnant women are trying to use or trying to quit smoking, it's not recommended for them to even use um, FDA for nicotine replacement therapy like the patch, the gum, or the lozenge. Um, so I would expect those same consequences to be the same from using an e-cigarette. Um, yes, and is that I, I want to say that I came across that um, that that very thing in the research report. It's just a matter of we were talking about adolescence, so I didn't focus in on that. But again, I, I just feel the need a, a bit. One of the um, factoids that's not known that with pregnancy, we're going to switch to adults just a little bit, that with a lot of the, what we're hearing about neonatal abstinence syndrome um, in the babies, and is that what they are, what they, it is found is that it is less uh, if the mothers are not using tobacco. The mothers may still be opioid users, but if you've got a tobacco user, non-tobacco user, the babies of the non-tobacco, non-nicotine using mothers will be less. Um, also, smaller babies too. What has the state done to control this? Legally, for our children. Currently, there is no state law um, that covers all of municipalities in terms of e cigarette usage in indoor spaces and in terms of possession of vapor products among youth. Now, with that said, if you municipalities uh, see a need or an interest or there's energy around uh, moving some of this stuff forward, they can. Um, so, like the city of Marshfield, I know, has e-cigarettes layered in their clean indoor air ordinance. The city of Wassa does as well. Uh, the city of Stevens Point just moved a policy through their Public Protections Committee to tighten up uh, municipal code with regards to possession of youth vapor products. That's to ensure that the liaison officers can uh, give citations to youth if the products are on school grounds. The challenge that they're seeing right now is that the youth might have the products, but there's no way to determine whether the product contains nicotine or not. The youth can just say there's there's no nicotine in here, um, so there's some problems with that. So while there's policy to be followed, we also want to point our um, school admin, support staff, and parents also um, to you know these kids are truly stressed and they do have poor coping mechanisms. We need to point them um, in the direction as far as to talk to their school counselors, have an open dialogue um, with their mentors and their parents and things like that. So long-winded answer, but um, locally, uh, things are happening currently. That's what I can tell you. Others? I want to put one of our school administrators on the spot right now. Um, he offered to speak. I want him to talk a little bit. There's an anonymous reporting app that some of those folks in the room that are from the schools may be interested in learning about, or maybe you have something at your school districts like that. So can you speak to that for a minute or something? <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, so we, we have a Stop It app. Does anybody have that in their schools? It's, a, it's an anonymous reporting tool that we use. Um, we have it K-12. Um, it can be used for bullying or, or anything that's going on in schools um, that, that should be going on. And kids can, the app is on their phone. Um, 
school administrators see it. Our principal um, is the super admin, so he sees all of them. Um, but I'm a high school uh, AP, so I see what's going on in the high schools. So um, other, there are a lot of kids in schools that don't want vaping to happen. It's happening in the bathrooms. They would rather just use the bathroom and be able to leave. Um, so we've encouraged them to use the app so that we can um, catch up because it's really hard in schools to catch kids vaping when they're in a bathroom so um, people want us to just be able to charge in there and grab the vapes and, and solve the problem but that's not reality um, so the stop it app has been helpful for us um, we've caught a bunch of kids with it um, but i guess the question that we have is if there are kids that are addicted that are under 18 other products um, that you suggest that we can help them, just help treat them rather than um, slap them with some punishments. Uh, so like I said, unfortunately, this is such an emerging issue that I'm not aware of any cessation programs that have been developed for you to help them get off these cigarettes. I know there is a program through the American Lung Association called Not, Not on Tobacco, um, which kids were or have been in the past referred to for cigarette smoking. Um, as far as treating their addiction, what we do know is effective is counseling. So something like the Wisconsin Tobacco Quit Line or them seeing their physician to get some kind of um, counseling points because um, this is not only physical addiction, it's also a conditioned behavioral component to it. Um, so what the counseling does is help them come up with a plan so that when they encounter triggers or cues or stresses in the future, they know how to um, overcome those to remain um, abstinent from this device. So as far as medication, um, there is insufficient evidence to recommend medication for adolescents. Um, however, if you have a youth who goes and sees their doctor and they are talking with them, it is up to that physician's discretion. Maybe they think that. Um, using a nicotine lozenge or using a nicotine patch would be effective to help um, wean them off of nicotine or that tobacco product completely. Um, that could be an option. So um, really maybe getting them into seeing their physician so they can come up with a plan to what's going to work best for them. All right, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, we're going to hang out for questions up front if you have more, but that does conclude our presentation for today. Um, so thank you for attending and to all partners and um, to my fellow presenters here. If you could, remember to fill out your evaluations and mark somewhere where you um, heard about the event. We would appreciate that. Please take time to stop by the table and check out products um, and grab resources on your way out. And on behalf of the Central Wisconsin Tobacco Free Coalition, we thank you for giving up your time this afternoon to come to this. And on behalf of the AOD partnership, um, this was able to be recorded. So thank you all.